Um, all right. So, Father, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, we are here to hear from you. We thank you for this time of worship where we got to tell you that we love you as your people. We thank you. You've protected us. You've guarded us through this whole storm, Lord. You're very merciful and kind to us, Lord. And we trust, Lord, that you have plans. We trust you're moving us forward. We trust that you're doing great and mighty things. And uh, I pray tonight, Lord, that your word would really speak to your people, God. Father, you know I want your word just to speak to your people. I know that you want it even more than I do. And I pray that it would in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 7 is kind of like the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. You may not realize that, but it's the story of when God cut his covenant with David. All right. Now, I thought it'd be interesting because Jim brought this up. So I figured it'd be worth sort of taking a second to, to zoom way out and find out what was happening in the world at large during this time. It's about a thousand BC. Okay. And this is, we're going to find out as we go through this chapter, this is where David is sort of at the, the height of his power. You want to think after Goliath, you know, the defeats to Goliath, after he runs for all those years, after he becomes king, after he's ruled for a while, but before he blows it with Bathsheba, right? So, so you want to think David in his prime, you know, like at his best, about 40, 45 years old. So he's rising, God's raising him up. And I want you to understand that this is an incredible contrast to what's happening everywhere else in the world. So I'll give you a couple examples. At this time, about 1000 BC in Egypt, they called it the third intermediate period. And this was a, a time in which the entire nation was divided into small local warring tribes. So when we think of Egypt in the scripture, we think of the Pharaoh, right? We think of a very strong country. Not so at this time. They are like all the way civil war type divided. How about Mesopotamia? So the same thing was happening there. Um, the, the Assyrian Empire was emerging, but they weren't going to come to the peak of their power much, much later on. Okay, so they were, they were just starting the Assyrian Empire. We're going to see them like in, uh, later in the book of Daniel and stuff like that, um, but they're not there yet. So they're not a major power either. Then how about around where Turkey is? Okay, you guys ever heard of the Hittites in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, this is right when the Hittite Empire had finally completely collapsed. Okay, so it's about 1180 BCE. So a lot of these big players that you saw them fight with the Exodus and they had the Ittites and the Amorites and all that kind of stuff, they're all just going into the dustbin of history at this point. Even in Greece, this is what's called the Greek Dark Ages. Now, we always think, I was thinking about this, we always think, uh, I guess because of words like progress or words like evolution, it's kind of in our psyche or our mindset that things always go one way, you know? And that can be really disastrous if you think it's supposed to be that way even in your Christian walk. Because I remember one time, and again, it was my mentor and best friend, Pat, at the time, she was like 80 something. And I had just, I had this house and I was on the verge of losing this house and all that kind of stuff. And I was really upset because it took me all these years of going from like homeless, apartment, small town home, house, bad job, a little bit better job. You know what I mean? Like that slow progress, progress climb. And, I, and I, the job was gone. And I was about to lose the house. And I called her and I just was, I was absolutely felt devastated, you know? And she's like, oh, I've had to start over two or three times. I was like, what? She goes, yeah. It's not, it's not like this, you know? And Jim can tell you that. Everyone, it's been around. It's not, it's not always just like this. And in history, at times, you can see where God's people even hit heights, like this Temple of Solomon, where things were really glorious and powerful and you know, gold was everywhere. Gold was as common as rocks in the streets and stuff. Then they had declines and stuff like that. So, but at this point, this was, ha this even happened in the secular world where they were all on the downfall. Greece, even though we think of Greek literature, right? The Greek architecture, they were, uh, they were basically illiterate. They were scattered. There was a few of them left. And lastly, in China, there was a big change between the Zhao dynasty and the Shang dynasty, which means nothing to us, but they were just major shifts. I mean, all over the world. So one thing I wanted to point out is this, is even if the world at large is in a state of massive transition, in a state where everything, you know, what was is just being replaced by some new thing and whatever, God's kingdom is not shaken. God's kingdom does not rise and fall in power like that. Okay. And we see here that the beginning of uh, first Samuel, second Samuel chapter seven, 
David, the king settled into his palace, for the Lord had given him relief from all his enemies on all sides. The first thing I want to point out is this. Everybody else fell away when that happened to them. He was in his palace, so he's rich. The Lord gave him relief from all his enemies on all sides. How many people fall away from God when they finally get a victory? You know what I mean? When you finally don't have to be in a position where you're begging God, Lord, please my light bill, Lord, please my water bill, Lord, please this bill, Lord, please that bill. You know? And the minute they're surrounded by peace and God's given them just a little bit of victory, where's God? I'm not going to church. I'm not going to prayer meeting. I'm not fasting. I'm not praying. I don't, there's no need for that. David's the opposite. He's a man after God's own heart. He pressed into and remembered the Lord we're about to find in his prosperity. Even his son Solomon, as we know, had some troubles with prosperity, right? But so, so just think about this. The, the, the king settled into his palace, for the Lord gave him relief from his enemies on all sides. The king said to Nathan the prophet, Look, I'm living in a palace made from cedar, while the ark of God sits in the middle of a tent. Nathan replied to the king, You should go and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. Now, I was just thinking of it. It's just so simple. I love, like, David. He's such a man, you know? Because he's walking around his house. He has a nice house. He's just walking around his house one day. That's all he says he's doing. He wasn't in the middle of an extended fast. He was just walking around his house being like, Hey, Nathan, how come I have a house? But he looks out the window, and there's the, the, the tent. You know, God met with his people in the tent of meeting. It was literally a tent. God was homeless because his people were homeless. And they wandered everywhere. He wandered with them, right? Remember, Jesus was homeless too. You know, foxes of the, um, have holes in the ground and birds have nests in the air, but the Son of Man had no way to lay his head. They were a pilgrim people, but God finally gave them a place of peace. And the first thing David thought was, well, if I have a house, that could be you don't have a house, God. You know, I just, I just something about that moved me. Do we think that way? Do we just think about like, Lord, you know, I kind of have this good or that good. And do we think about the Lord in those terms? And I was thinking to myself, I've heard, I read some interpreters who kind of thought this was like a kind of pride or something. I don't think it's pride. I think if you bless your kids and they're happy, you know, they may be misguided thinking they can give you something, but it's still out of love and concern and care that they, they want to do it. I live in a house made from cedar where the ark of God sits in the middle of a tent. Nathan replied to the king, you should go and do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. Nathan is the same one that later rebukes him. Okay. David surrounded himself with godly men and he didn't push them out when things got tough. That's just one note in his prosperity, in his prosperity. A lot of people want a godly man or woman in their life when they're in trouble because they want to hear from the Lord. But now you're in a position of power. You don't have to listen to anybody, but you still want the man of God in your life. Okay, that's pretty pretty interesting right there. And Nathan, by the way, this is a comfort if you guys ever have to go back and re-pray about something. Nathan's the prophet, you know? He, and he's running it by the prophet. The prophet's supposed to be the voice of the Lord. Nathan's like, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. He goes home. God's like, no, go, <laughs> go talk to him, you know? All right, so that night, the Lord's message came to Nathan Go tell my servant, David, this is what the Lord has said. Do you, do you really intend to build a house for me to live in? I have not lived in a house from the time I brought the Israelites up from Egypt to this present day. Instead, I was traveling with them and living in a tent. Wherever I moved among all the Israelites, I did not say to any of their leaders whom I appointed to care for my people, Israel, why have you not built me a house? made from cedar. So like I said, some commentators kind of read an attitude into that. I don't really read a bad attitude into that. I think it's kind of like a, huh? Like a dad. Like a dad. I, I read that as him being like, I didn't ask for that. That's really, that's really sweet of you, David. But then he goes on to tell him, we find this actually in, in Chronicles, not here, but God says to David, look, here's part of the problem. You have shed too much blood. You've been a man of war. You can help prepare for the temple, but you can't build the temple. Mark, do you mind turning that off? The, oh, yeah. I, I, I don't. The light is like really. Oh, it's, it's light. Oh. Yeah, that's that's like killing me, bro. Sorry. I it's OK. We're recording it if you oh, want to watch okay. it later. Yeah, I just like the sermon. No, just watch it later. It's, I'll yeah. watch it later. it's OK. Thank you. That's very That's very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, is that. Um, I could, the Lord had to sort of like he saw David's heart is what I'm trying to get at. 
he honored, he saw that David had a desire to do something good. But even when we want to do something good for the Lord, we have to do things God's way. You know what I mean? And um, my daughter tries to help sometimes, but I have to show her how to help. So when people kind of read into this, that sort of like a pride or something, I don't see that here. I just see God giving him more direction on how we should do it. David had fulfilled one part of God's plan where he had defeated the enemies everywhere, but the temple was going to be a place of peace. So it had to be his son Solomon that was going to bring that. So moving on. This is what the Lord says. Do you really intend to build a house for me? Let me read that part. Sorry. The Lord said, I've never asked for that. Verse eight. So now say this to my servant, David. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has said. I took you from the pasture, from your work as a shepherd, to make you a leader of my people Israel. I was with you wherever you went, and I defeated all your enemies before you. Now I will make you as famous as the, the great men of the earth. I will establish a place for my people Israel and settle them there. They will live there and not be disturbed anymore. Just this, this point, I will make you as famous as the great men of the earth. What's really unique about this covenant that God makes with David um, is there wasn't really like something like this other than God spoke to Abraham, promises to Abraham, right? But I want to sort of give you why I call this John 3.16 of the Old Testament because it's referenced constantly theologically all throughout the rest of the Old Testament and give you an idea of what God is doing with this covenant. We're going to continue reading it. We're going to see what he says there, but I want to make sure and kind of give you an explanation In Before this with Moses, think about the Mosaic Covenant, right? It was a covenant God was attempting to make with all of the people, okay? And it was like this contract where God says, okay, look, if everyone does everything I say, then we get to go into the promised land. If everyone does everything that I say, okay? If your dad came into the room and said, if everyone behaves, we're going to get ice cream, you know you're never getting ice cream, right? Because the problem is it was a covenant with the people. And it was all the people, okay? The difference is with date, and also it was a requirement covenant. You will get this if you fulfill that, okay? With David, it's a different kind of covenant. It's a grant. So here's the difference. With a grant, think of um, a wealthy king, and he has a servant that he's pleased with. And he's like, you know what? Because I'm pleased with you, I'm going to grant you individually this land. So it's something where he's announcing on his end, this is what's going to happen, and this is the way it is. Do you see the difference? One is a, an individual, a covenant between God and all the people where they have to fulfill all the terms of the contract in order to get in. The other one is God just declaring, I find you worthy, here you go. And he's like, and we're going to see how David responds to that, okay? So God says, I'll make you as famous as the great men of the earth. Man, that blew me away when I thought about the fact that we're still talking about David today. You know, <laughs> it's just like God was not kidding, man. Um, I will establish a place for my people Israel and settle them there. They will live there and will not be disturbed anymore. Violent men will not oppress them again as they did in the beginning. And during the time when I appointed judges to lead my people Israel. Instead... I will give you relief from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that he himself will build a dynastic house for you. I love that God is doing a play on words here. David's walking around his house. He's like, I have a house. God, you want a house? And God's like, I didn't ask for a house, but let me just tell you something, David. Let me tell you who you're dealing with. You want to give me a house? I'm going to establish a household for you for eternity. You know what I mean? One of the things I want to stir you guys with you cannot outgive God. You cannot outbless God. And one of the things I want to focus on today is what's your vision of the Lord like? What's your vision of the Lord like? Do you see him as this kind of God? Do you see him as the kind of God that if you offer, you sacrifice anything to him, you, you want to do anything, he will just bless you so much that you're literally dumbfounded, which we're going to find out that happens to David, okay? So, so David wants to build God a physical house. God builds David a dynasty. When the time comes for you to die, I will raise up your descendant, one of your own sons to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. He'll build a house for my name, and I'll make his dynasty permanent. I'll become his father, and he'll become my son. Listen to this. 
When he sins, I will correct him with the rod of men and with wounds inflicted by human beings. But my loyal love will not be removed from him as I removed it from Saul when I removed him from before you. Your house and your kingdom will stand before me permanently. Your dynasty will be permanent. Nathan told David all these words that were revealed to him. This blows David's mind because even if, if the promises are to David, right? And God's going to keep his word to David. Then any of his descendants individually may participate in that blessing or may not. But God himself is covenanting himself to making sure it happens. You follow what I'm saying? It is an unconditional promise on God's side. The condition on their side is simply, and it it lays this out in many other places, just believe and obey. Don't worship other gods. It's pretty simple. I I could have pulled up like 13 examples, but they all boil down to that. Like, hey, I am completely committed. I will establish your kingdom forever, David, because you wanted to honor me. But all you got to do is just believe. All you got to do is just obey me and don't worship other gods. Now, we know that these individuals fell off. These kings, all of them failed. And who ended up succeeding? Jesus, right? Jesus. Jesus of the line of David, right? This is what I mean was an unconditional covenant on God's side. God said this is going to happen. And because of that, it did happen, but it happened in Christ. And I'll bring all this together for you guys for personal application in a bit. But just bear with me. I want us to at first understand what the scripture itself is saying and and understand it in its own context. And then we can think about personal application. Okay? God bless you. Okay. All right. So just to um, my note, what I was saying is you cannot bless God. He'll never be in debt to anyone. He will make the exchange so uneven, it's clear who's God and who's the human. What's your vision of God like? Do you see God as stingy, hard to please, or do you see him as unable to do anything? God promised to discipline Solomon, but not to remove the kingdom from him, unlike Saul. Solomon may or may not be personally lost, depending on his behavior, but the kingdom would not be. God would fulfill his his promises. Now, I want to go on to David's response. Okay, so verse 18 King David went in and sat down before the Lord and said, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you should have brought me to this point? And you'll notice as we go through, he calls God sovereign Lord like seven different times. Okay. Um, That word sovereign, just to explain to you, it means that God gets the last word. It doesn't mean that God has the only word. And some people misunderstand the word sovereign and think that God controls every atom of every, you know, Every time you pass gas, every time you burp, every time you make every decision, that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that God is the king. The king establishes the laws in the land. The king will punish those who break his laws. And the king has the right to set up certain things that are going to happen. It doesn't mean he determines every single thing that's ever going to happen. But one of the things that God in his own power determined was going to happen is that David's kingdom would last. So he's acknowledging God's Final, the final sayiness of God. That's what sovereign God means. You have the final say. Everybody else has to say, you have the last say. All right, make sense? Hopefully it made sense to somebody. Okay. Um, and you didn't stop there, O Lord God. You have also spoken about the future of your servant's family. Is this your usual way of dealing with men, O sovereign Lord? I love that line and the interpretation of that in the NET. Because that the, in the Hebrew, it's actually kind of a riddle. Um, so it says both, this is a revelation to mankind about who you are. And also, is this a revelation to mankind about who you are? It's like, he's like, wait, wait, God, you're like this. All I was doing was walking through my house thinking we should like improve the church. (laughs) And you, you, you come out like this and he's just, he's just, he's dumbfounded. He can't understand the goodness of the Lord. They may remember the first time you actually met the Lord. Were you not blown away of his character, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his love? Were you not floored by how, you know, about who God is and how he is? I mean, it was just making me think about, think of that. And yes, this is a revelation to us that God is a very personal God. He's a personal God. He made a covenant, not just with a nation, but with David, a certain person. That covenant was fulfilled in Jesus. And then your faith in Christ is individual. As well, and corporate. Okay. Is this your usual way of dealing with men, O sovereign Lord? What more can David say to you? You have given your servant special recognition, O sovereign Lord. 
For the sake of your promise and according to your purpose, you have done this great thing in order to reveal it to your servant. And it goes on from there, but actually I'm going to just stop there. And I want you guys to highlight if you're taking notes. Verse 21. For the sake of your what? For the sake of your what? Your word or your promise, right? And according to your purpose. His promise and his purpose. Here's what I want to focus on when it comes to personal application. Okay? David accepted that God was going to bless him. But he had the wisdom to understand what was happening here. God made a promise to him. Therefore, God fulfilled that promise. God had a larger purpose. Therefore, he fell into that larger purpose. And you even find later on in this passage when he's, he's, he's reciting back to the Lord, he's like, Lord, because you said this promise and because it's for the purpose of your kingdom, now bring that promise and that purpose to pass. Okay? And here's my question. Do you, do you understand that you belong to the Lord body and soul and that means all your problems are God's problems? Do you ever make yourself God's problem? Or do you ever tell, do you, do you pray in a way that you're telling God you have a problem? Right. But here's the thing, though. Do you understand if you are the Lord's, your problems are his problems? Sure. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you a very practical example. And I'll, and I'll show you from Scripture. I'm not just making this up. I remember years ago, I was, again, very financially struggling. I had this car. I owed payments on it. It was killing me constantly, constantly. And I got tired of it. And I think I told you guys this story before. But this, I didn't have Scripture for it. But something just hit me at that time. Something of the Holy Spirit helped me understand what I was about to say. I was always thinking about my sins and my responsibilities to the Lord, you know? And I would tell the Lord, you know, Lord, everything I have is, is yours. Lord, everything I have is yours. And then it hit me. Everything I have is the Lord's. Lord, I got some debt. And I went outside and I laid my hands on that car. And I said, no, Lord, here's the thing. Everything I have is yours, including this car. So, Lord, they're going to repossess your car. And it's going to hurt your credit score. And it's not going to make you look good. So, Lord, for the sake of your name, this car needs to get paid off. I'm telling you the car got paid off. Wow. I'm telling you. I was sick as a dog earlier today. I couldn't move around. I felt, I felt awful. I couldn't even hang out with Lucas. And I laid hands on myself and I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, it is your will that I preach your word. For the sake of your plan, for the sake of your promise, I pray that you heal me right now so I can preach your word to your people because you want your word preached. I felt the anointing hit me. I'm not 100% better, but I can stand up here and preach. Yeah. Okay? What I'm asking you is, do you understand this kind of covenant-keeping, covenant-making God, and how personal he takes you? Okay? So let me give you a couple examples. In Psalm chapter 25, verse 11, this is David praying, okay? He says, For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Did he say, for because I need you to forgive me? Who, for whose sake did he ask for, that God would forgive him? For God's sake. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Do you have that kind of revelation about your covenant relationship with God? How about um, this other example? In Daniel um, chapter 9, verse 5. If you guys want to go to these passages with me, you certainly can. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. Sorry to be gross, but I blow my nose. Get out. I know. <laughs> Edit that out. Probably sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. Does everybody have a Bible? You, where's your Bible? Well, go go grab one of those. You can't be in church without no Bible. Okay. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. I'm actually going to... Um, I might read a little bit of this to give you an idea of how the men of God and the women of God in Scripture understood this principle I'm trying to get through to you guys today about for the sake of God's
plan for the sake of God's purpose. He will do things in your life if you begin to view your problems as his problems and vice versa. Okay? I'll start with verse 4. This is, um, they've been in exile for uh, 70 years at least. And Daniel's praying a prayer of repentance. I prayed to the Lord my God, confessing in this way, O Lord, great and mighty, awesome God, who is faithful to his covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We've sinned. We have done what is wrong and wicked, and we have rebelled by turning away from your commands and standards. We have not paid attention to your servants, the prophets, who spoke by your authority to our kings, our leaders, our ancestors, and to all the inhabitants of the, the land as well. And the thing is, like, he, he's confessing, but he's calling on God to keep his covenant. Like, God is faithful to his covenant. You know what I mean? He's, he knows that objectively speaking, God made a promise. It's not a, it's not, um, it's a one-sided promise where God is promising on his end, the door is always open. I will fulfill this plan. Okay? No matter what. And so he has this confidence that even if I stray, I know where God stands on the matter. I know where God's coming from. I know I can go to him for the sake of his name, for the sake of his promise, for the sake of his word. He will keep his word, he will forgive my sins because he said he will forgive my sins. He will bail me out of bondage here because he said he would, you know, because that's that's the kind of God that he is. Right, that's exactly it. Repentance is our part, right? Where we, we just turn away from our sin, we turn to the Lord. But we know, we have confidence he will receive us because he promised, right? So it's not like a situation where it's kind of half of us and half of him. Where, okay, on our end, we got to keep these commandments and promises in order for God to go with us. And on his end, you know, we'll see if we can make an arrangement. He's like, no, I have committed myself 100% to David and to all the kings that would come after David, which would then be Jesus, the fulfillment of everything. And God goes, no matter what happens, whoever, whatever individual wants to walk away or not, my kingdom will come on earth through the line of David. And anyone, anywhere that turns to him as part of the covenant. You understand? You have to see the, the subtleness in God's heart, the, the determination that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. I hope I'm not losing you guys. I hope you're, you're following what I'm saying. That you can have confidence that you can, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and heaven. That if you turn to the Lord, he is, for the sake of his plan and his purpose, he will accomplish what he's going to accomplish on this earth. It's just a matter of if you're turning towards him or not. You don't have to wonder if he's going to do his end of things. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, I'm going to read a couple more of these. In Psalm 79, 9. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sin for your name's sake. Now, there are dozens of verses like this, okay? Um, and we, can, we can go there if you want, or I just can read it to you, or you can make a note of it. I just wanted to read a, a number of these to you. Um, I'm going to give you another one. And again, if you don't want to turn there, just, just make a note of these and, or I, I can send them to you. Romans? No. Second Kings 19. Oh, yeah. And, and again, don't worry about turning there. I'll just read them to you. And if you want them, yeah. Second Kings 19, 19. Now, O Lord, our God, this is Hezekiah praying, deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. So Hezekiah understood that his problems were God's problems. You follow, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Hey, God, you can't let this guy defeat us because what would they say about you? Mm -hmm. Do you pray like that? Okay, do you say, okay, Lord, here's the deal. My children cannot end up lost. <laughs> They're lost right now. I'm praying for their salvation. You know, they told me, no, we don't believe. Okay, Lord, for the sake of your name, for the sake of your promise, for the sake of the fact that I believe that me and my household will serve the Lord, for the sake of the fact that I believe that, you know, you train children when they're young, when they're old, they'll turn back to God. Now, some people say those aren't absolute promises. Okay, fine. Believe what you want. That's fine. I get that, you know. But I'm still standing on it. <laughs> I'm still saying, hey, Lord, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, and lost person, you know. Bring them back, God, for the sake of your great name, for the sake of your glory. How about your job? You know, you need a job? Well, if you've been praying God in your job, God in your job, God in your money, God in your money, you're praying selfish and small. How about you start praying, Lord, it is your will that I make enough money to give to the kingdom of God. 
to, uh, to help people who are in poverty, whatever. When you align yourself with God's purpose and God's plan, you'll find God's provision. How about for the sake of relationships? I've said this to you guys many times. I did not meet Feli until I got, I started praying like this. And I said, God, you know what? If you send me the woman you have for me, I will serve her. I'll serve you together with her in ministry the rest of my life. I'll, I'll sell the business. I'll do anything you want. But I'll serve you, right? That's what got us together. I hope so you guys are picking up what I'm saying. Okay, I'll just give you a couple more. Again, you don't have to turn there. I'll just let you know. Um, Jehoshaphat had a bunch of people invading. In Second Chronicles 20, 12, he goes, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. Um, Paul was praying for the people of God, but he was praying for the people of God from the perspective of the Father, want, knowing for him knowing it was the Father's will they had revelation of who he is, right? So in Ephesians 1, 17, I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom revelation so you may know him better. He, Paul was starting from the place, God, it's your will that your people know you better. So, Father, I pray you'd pour out your spirit. Why? Because you want them to know you better for the sake of your great name. And I can go on and on in examples, but I, that's, that's really the, the main thing I wanted, to, I wanted to do. And I'll give one last example, okay? Acts chapter 4, verse 29. The, Christ, the believers are being persecuted. And here's how they pray. They, they take the same kind of language from the Old Testament. And they said, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Lord, they're threatening your name, your people. Lord, what's it going to mean if, if they can actually extinguish the gospel? If it, Lord, they're going to persecute us, but we're going to need Holy Ghost power to overcome the persecution. Do you pray that way? Do you, are you kingdom minded in your personal needs? Or are they just personal needs? And I, I know I'm being repetitive, but I just want to make that very, very clear. I've met people who just don't have effective prayer lives. I've done it myself. They're like, well, God doesn't answer me. How come he always answers you? I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you one of the secrets to getting your prayers answered is to be thinking in terms of God's plan, be thinking in terms of God's purpose, be thinking in terms of God's kingdom, and you can see people who, even though they say the Lord, they never get their prayers answered. And every time you talk to them, like, yeah, because you're a selfish rat. You are. You're a selfish rat. You never think beyond the cheese that you want in front of you. You don't care. You don't, you're not thinking about God's purpose and God's plan and God's kingdom. You know? But if you just ever would and go, Lord, you know, instead of me running around trying to figure this out, I want to serve you. I want your kingdom, your plan, your provision. Help me to get my mind off of myself and onto what you're doing and what you want to do. And I'm telling you, all the power of heaven will come behind that. All the power of heaven will come behind that. And it started off with David walking around his house, being thankful for what he had, and going, Lord, how come you don't have a house? And God, and God just shows up like in a pillar of fire almost. I mean, he wasn't visible. But he's like, house? Household for eternity. And David's like, ah! You know, if we go on and read, David literally is like falling apart. He's like, he does not know what to do. He's like, who am I? Who's my household? Why have you spoken like this to David? What can David say to you? God, I don't even know. He's like completely falling apart. You know, it's absolutely incredible. I love it. Um, but I didn't want to, you know, wear you guys' attention out and just continue reading the whole thing. But go read it later. Go read it later. And th just think about yourself and David's shoes thinking about it and the way he expresses himself. It's beautiful. It's glorious. So that's what I had on my heart today. That's what, huh? Awesome. Makes sense? Yeah. All right. Second Samuel 7 about God's promise, promises, God's plan, God's provision for his promises and his plan. Let's pray. So, Father, we humbly come before you. What I know is kind of a different kind of message today. I know it's a little complicated maybe in some ways, Lord, but I pray that your Holy Spirit would apply the parts that people needed to hear to them to them. I pray that you change our prayer life. I pray you change our focus. I pray you'd help us not to be shy about making our bills your bills. Our sickness, your need for healing, because it gives you glory. Lord, our loneliness, your need for, to, to touch and comfort and bring the right people in our life. Lord, I pray that we'd understand that we're in covenant with a God who really cares. We're in covenant with a God who will not be out, out blessed. We can't think of giving you anything that you won't bless us so much, God, that we're just dumbfounded and our jaws are on the floor. Lord, you will not be a debtor to anyone. 
Father, I pray, I cry out to you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowing you and all your people today. I pray that something would click. Something would click. There would be a fundamental change in, 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 in the way they approach their problems. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind everyone in the church this week as they face a problem to not just be like, oh God, I got a problem, but say, Lord, we have a problem. Lord, for the sake of your name, for the sake of your promise, for the sake of your kingdom, this cannot stand, Lord. we got to see this happen. And God, you'll honor your name. You'll honor your word. You'll honor your covenant. You will. You will. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.